how can we build something together facing the challenges of time and place? Okay? okay. This is your question. Okay. So, uh, from our point of view, we can see that we have, it's, uh, I mean, you can see it, okay? We have many challenges of time and place in the digital era to overcome, okay? Um, but what about Canada? What are your challenges? I mean, uh, what are those challenges of time and place that may bring about this ethics of respect between uh, uh, us and you? I think it's very important that you make this clear to us because we have this, this uh, history of uh, colonization and then maybe it's important that you say what are the challenges that you have? Okay. Thank you very much. A wonderful question. Uh, Canada also is a colonized country and we are still dealing with the challenges of colonization and its aftermath. Um, indigenous peoples in Canada are still not fully accorded respect for their languages, cultures, autonomy, or for the treaties they negotiated. We have a different history, indigenous peoples, many of them, uh, negotiated treaties with the Crown, the, the representative from Britain, um, and those treaties were not respected by uh, the country that became Canada in 1867. Um, others are still being negotiated today. Um, there was an official apology by the Prime Minister of Canada to Indigenous peoples for the residential school system where there was a deliberate government policy to destroy their culture and languages by taking them from their families, their family and local culture, and attempting to um, indoctrinate them into European values, understandings, religious beliefs in the, what was in a very abusive environment. And it will take many generations, I think, to recover from that experience. Um, so Canadians, uh, the Canadian government, Canadian universities are beginning um, to try to address the challenge of encouraging more indigenous peoples um, to attend universities um, while also trying to incorporate their understandings, their views, their philosophies of education into our system. So setting up a dialogue that will work both ways um, where they, we all become bicultural, they learn the Eurocentric uh, system, but we try to learn more about their system. Um, you may know that Professor Ian Martin from Glendon College has done a lot of work with indigenous languages, and he, he just was an examiner for the first PhD thesis in Canada, I think, to be written in an indigenous language in the Mi'kmaq language. So this is a challenge because these are innovations that are not widely practiced, still not widely accepted. The general public in Canada still does not understand that history and the implications of that history. There's still um, an implicit belief that northern ways of doing things, western ways of doing things, Eurocentric ways of doing things are the best. Um, so that has implications both for how um, Canada deals with indigenous pressures but also with our increasingly multicultural environment where we have people from all over the world coming to Canada and trying to learn to work together trying to develop uh, 
ways of learning and respecting each other and many problems have occurred. Uh, the final chapter to my book Crosstalk talks about one incident in Canada that has posed a serious challenge to multiculturalism and to Canadian policies of what is called reasonable accommodation. To accommodate difference is still to assume someone holds the power and someone else is being accommodated. Changing that mindset is not easy. From my point of view, for this kind of work, a big challenge is Canadian complacency. Because Canadians think they are part of the developed world, part of the G8 and the G20, uh, because they sp most of them, to uh, what is it, three quarters of them, speak English, they think they do not need to learn other languages. Um, and when they think about Brazil, um, there is still the stereotype, the exotic stereotype that Brazil promotes in its advertising that encourages Canadians to think about Brazil in a certain way that does not facilitate respect and reciprocal exchange. So when I talk about this project, uh, I often get asked, how do you deal with the power differential between Canada and Brazil? And that is a very tricky question because on the one hand, it still holds the assumption that the power is with Canada and the North, and that you, Brazil, are the global South with less power. Even as the question wants to move toward finding ways of changing the assumed power structure. But my response is always to try to complicate things a bit. I recognize there are huge problems in Brazil, huge inequities. Um, a huge structural deficiency still, but Brazil as a nation is changing very quickly. It's an emerging economy that's doing much better than the Canadian economy. Um, so that larger context also needs to be recognized. So the approach that I have suggested is a very small research team because I think we need to work one on one, develop that trust, that respect. We need to learn from you. We need to hear how you see the picture and what you think would facilitate better interaction and respect. Our project is designed to have this inner circle, just a few universities and people working together. And then we use events like this to bring in a wider audience in different regions of Brazil and Canada. And then we use the internet. Some of you maybe uh, may follow the Center for Globalization and Cultural Studies on the internet. Um, through the internet, we interact with a global community. And as we interact, we are becoming a global community. People who share these same questions and are aware of these same difficulties. So um, I, think, uh, I think those are some of the problems. I could go on at length, but I'm sure there's other questions. <laughs>